Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Country Cast. We have a very special guest joining us today. We are really honored to have him on the channel. Today, we are going to be talking to Luke Combs' drummer, Jake Summers. Man, so great to have you on here. Really appreciate you taking time to do this, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is going to be fun. I, uh, I got to kick it off, though, with the big, the big stuff that's happening right now. You guys have had 10 shows in stadiums that have reached the masses and you guys are selling tickets left and right. And uh, they're being packed out every night. You guys are doing like two shows a night at, at stadiums. Um, what does it, what does it feel like, man, to have the best seat in the house at those shows? Like what, what feeling do you get sitting on the throne, looking at a sea of people who are there just to enjoy y'all show? Man, honestly, <clears throat> I still pinch myself every show, but it's really a whirlwind. It's like, you know, once, you have this huge adrenaline rush being behind when the intro music's playing and, and you know, the, the, the video is playing, you hear the crowd erupt and cheer and all that stuff. And then once you hit the stage from that first note and it's go time, you're just in the moment of, all right, you know, we're playing the show. I mean, you're having fun. And uh, yeah, it's, it's honestly crazy to think about, you know, I, I don't think anybody, when you're a kid who wants to become a professional musician ever thought I'm going to be playing stadiums yeah. as I mean, an every, every weekend thing, you know, it's like, you just dream of that. But then when it's happening, you're like, okay, you know, like this is, I mean, obviously it's really cool, but you're like, you still have to pinch yourself. Like, okay, I'm in arrowhead stadium. I'm in, you know, Bush stadium. I, I we just to, we know in, april we did two nights in nashville yeah they were like crazy. ninety-five thousand plus i believe yeah around, around yeah. that number for yeah for the total of both shows <laughs> yeah we're talking almost a hundred thousand folks man that's insane mm -hmm. well like yeah, you're talking about the intro and stuff like is there a is there like a ritual you guys do before you hit the stage uh yeah I mean, we do i think I, like, we do a huddle i think every group kind of does their own yeah huddle formation um, and we have like a little saying that we like to, to yell after, uh, we count down, but, you know, I'm obviously not going to say it, but, yeah. uh, but you know, it's our thing and we love it. And, uh, it's been our thing, gosh, for at least four or five, maybe even longer years now. That's awesome, man. You guys have uh, such a good chemistry on stage. It's a flaw. It's a flawless show every night. I mean, it's just. Every single show is perfectly matched to the record and the folks, you know, you bring out the energy where folks just go ballistic and it's, it's such a fun thing to be a part of, been a part of a few of them myself. And just to see it is even if you're not there and you're seeing this stuff online, it is just energetic and it's, it's electric. So you guys, you guys do phenomenal and that's why y'all are as successful as you guys are and you're hell of a musician. So thank you. I, you know, it's like we like to have fun. You know, yeah. Yes, it's a job, but it, it, in the long in the long run, you should be you should be there to have fun. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, you, you practice your parts at home. You do the extensive rehearsals. Then by the time you do, you know, the first few shows, you get them under your belt, and everybody gets more comfortable as the shows go on. Then it's like I don't want to say autopilot, but you have everything muscle memoryed out. And then you could just play the show and enjoy it and really enjoy yourself. Yeah. And there, you know, when you say autopilot, I guess it would kind of be like you get in a groove too, you know, maybe when you first hit the stage, but, but eventually things kind of flatten out a little bit and the groove kind of kicks in and everybody just starts having fun because you feed off of, of the crowd and you guys do that so well. And Thank you. the way you guys play already, it, goes over into the crowd. Like they feel that they, they can see that you guys have fun every night. And I think that's a big part of it that, uh, that stands out. So it's incredible, man. Well, it's funny. It's like, you know, obviously with energy wise, we feed off of each other, but you know, we really do feed off the crowd and you can, you know, say there was a night where it was like a third, say it was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it's like, okay, the Thursday night, they work the next day. You know, it's like it, it would progress like Thursday night's good. Friday night's really good. Saturday night's great. And they yeah. just like cut loose. Yeah. Um, but for these shows, it's just like everyone's into it. The crowds are incredible. Um, 
You know, it's still wild to hear everyone sing every word to every song. Every song. It's not like it's just the hits or what. I mean, it's every single song you guys play, which is, it's awesome, man. And um, it's crazy. you and Luke with that China is insane. Like yeah, that, yeah. that moment just, just comes into play and it's like, wow, these dudes are killing it. That's it's really fun. awesome. How'd that come about? You know, man, that's a good question. I, I think it either happened last year or the year prior where uh, I think it was two years ago, maybe. Okay. Um, when I first brought it out and he kind of came up and I gave him a drumstick and it kind of took off from there. Um, he does it for the most part every show. Um, there have been like maybe like one or two times where he hasn't, but maybe he just forgot or he's just like, I'm, um, you know, just really tired and I want to just relax. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, kind of started out that way. And, uh, the only way we've only broken one so far and it was last year. That's impressive. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Very impressive. I mean, this one's definitely dented, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. it shows that it could take a beating. I'm really hoping it, if it lasts the entire tour, which I think it will because of, you know, we were doing one show a weekend. Now we'll be doing two come July. You know, it'll be a little more wear and tear, but yeah. it's worth it. Yeah, I would and, say and, so. And, and it's great for the Simple Company too, you know. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. I forgot what show it was. It might have been Arrowhead or one previous to it, but he he was hitting it so hard that it came off the stand. Um, and he picked it up and our photographer got a great photo of him holding it up. Like he's holding the WWE championship belt up. Right. <laughs> so I sent, I sent that photo to my Sabian rep. I was like, Hey, if you want to post this, obviously use our photographer's handle credit him, but it was a great shot of, yes, I'm the one who endorses the product, right? But here's a great shot of the boss holding, holding the symbol. Yeah. I mean, no better promo than that. Watch me exactly. beat it out for like five minutes and then I'm, you know, it, it just broke once or now they, they get to see it when that happens. That's cool, man. Well, yeah. it's a lot of fun. It's, it's crazy. It is so fun to see the, uh, the next part we'll jump into since we're talking about, you know, your kit right now and having a China and country music, which is sick. I love that you've incorporated that into the uh, kit. What got you into drumming, man? Like how did this I think a lot of people just, they, they always like to know about the musicians and, and how they got into this and, and what made them have the passion to go for that instrument. Yeah. Um, my dad's actually been playing music since he was 14. Oh, wow. Um, he's been playing guitar and singing since he was 14. And I grew up listening to everything he hit, he did, which was like the Beatles, Stones, Bruce Springsteen, all the classic rock stuff. Um, and then I kind of got into my own but my parents got me a drum set when I was six years old. But prior to that, at a cousin's wedding, when I was like three, I would say three years old, I had apparently asked the band leader if I can go sit in and play the drums when they had a break. And they said, yeah, my feet couldn't touch the pedals, but my hands were just going for it with the sticks. And I think my parents then recognized, like, okay, like he really loves, really loves this uh, instrument. And uh, even, I guess, prior to that, my mom's told me, and this might be a little embarrassing to say, but um, I guess when I was a baby and I was really just in a diaper, she has a photo of me with a box hat around my neck and drumsticks in my hands. I don't know where they got the drumsticks from, but it was kind of like predestined for it to happen. Yeah. So once they got me a, a drum set at six years old, I started taking lessons. And I mean, like every kid, you know, at that age, you're still going to obviously hang with your friends, play sports, play video games. But which I did, but then it's like every day after school, I would play drums for four to five hours a day, practicing, play along, playing along my favorite records, and I would just do it daily. Like, I just loved it. And That's what it takes too, man. It's kind of, you know, I knew, if I'm not jumping the gun, if you have another question, but um, oh, no. I knew at 15 years old that I wanted to do this professionally. So I quit playing video games cold turkey my parents were like this is great we don't have to tell them to stop playing video games any of that stuff so for me playing the four to five hours a day it went to like maybe between six to seven to eight hours a day oh yeah and um you know I was studying with incredible teachers back in new york and uh i knew my mom was like hey you're gonna go to college for this 
So I applied to four schools. I got into three of the four. And the one I went to was the perfect place for me called University of the Arts in Philly. Studied with incredible teachers there. Um, yeah, you had like Jimmy Paxson, Jerry Brown. And, I had those uh, two guys. I, the gentleman uh, from the Yellow Jackets. I think his name is Marcus Mar Baylor. Yep, Marcus Baylor. I uh, studied with Mark DiGiani, who is still, I'm very close with him. Uh, in New York, I studied with Dom Famulero and John Favicchia. Uh, wonderful, wonderful guys. Um, and the, the cool thing is like a few of those guys all know each other. Um, but, you know, just like learning from all six of those guys, it was all different in its own right, but it still made me the player I am today. And I didn't get into country music till my junior year of college. Oh, what were you, what were you doing before then? Like, what was your style? Um, I mean, I love rock and roll. Like I love the Foo Fighters. Um, hey man, shout out. Love, you know, love, you know, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, but also like Matchbox 20, John Mayer, um, old Maroon 5, yeah, stuff that really grew. All the legends. Um, and then obviously stuff prior to that, like James Brown. Um, there's a really cool funk group called Lettuce that I mm -hmm. enjoy. Okay. Um, like stuff with horns too, like uh, them, uh, Tower of Power. Um, and I like the R&B stuff too, because I enjoy like all the, the chops that these guys do that I try to practice at home and don't use obviously within the gig. But I try to be as well-rounded as possible because my school was a jazz school. So I had to learn every genre under the sun. I but think that's so good though, in a way, because you, you get rounded out and there's different techniques and styles that you can play, you know, if there's room for it in the set or in the song or whatever, I, you know, that just rounds you out as a drummer and that's. Oh, totally. No, it, it makes you a, you know, well-rounded player. And it's, it's really great to be able to know how to utilize those different genres. And then in some ways or another, they kind of seep in your playing after practicing them or playing them for X amount of time. Yeah. Um, I mean, it all starts from jazz and that's what I went to college for. And then, you know, learning to play different time signatures and all these other things are all great to have in your back pocket. Um, and obviously my junior year of college, that was kind of like, I feel like when the bro country stuff was kind of slightly emerging. Um, and country wasn't what it used to be back in the 70s, the 80s, and, you know, the 90s. But now it's like, now there's so many different versions of country. Like, Hardy's like the new rock country. Absolutely. You know, uh, Hardy. Morgan Wallen, to me, is like kind of trap country. Yeah. And then Luke is like, Luke's country, but like he's bringing back the 90s. Has some inflections of, like, rock, depending on the song. Um but yeah, I mean, I think to me, like those three guys are really the new big three to me. And well, I mean, the way that they do it and present their styles, you know, with their bands and the way they relay it from stage to crowd, I think that does explain a lot of the reason why they are the big three um, or could be called yeah. that because yeah, yeah, yeah. their music is, you know, I was watching an interview earlier today. It's funny you bring this up that they, the folks were talking about how, country musicians and, and country artists may have lost their character and personality a little bit during the, the bro era when it kind of mm -hmm. plateaued a yeah. little bit. So it's interesting that we're talking about this now. Cause you know, th those three definitely when, when the pretty much the first note, you can tell who it is instantly without playing the whole song. And you're like, okay, I know who that is immediately. I don't even have to listen to it anymore. I just know who it is. Or um, yeah, just their voice alone too. Exactly. And the voice is an instrument and it, you know, it may have gotten oh, lost cool. there for a little while, you know, in that era we spoke of earlier, but now it's coming back with these guys, um, mm, which is great. But, you know, I have to say this to, to you, you guys, when you came in the game, the bro country thing was still kind of lingering around a little bit, but you guys were one of the first that I really noticed that was taking a hold of putting it back into the hands of the instrument instead of taking the instrument out of it because the drums were pure drums and you were hearing a lot of that, but, the, but some of the music and the, uh, the instruments were, were not necessarily there during that time, but you guys were one of the first, I believe that I recognize that they're starting to use this or they, that's how they play. Mm -hmm. And that's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, I think like Stapleton kind of paved the way for that. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Because he, he well, remained true right. to the traditional foundation sound anyways. And, uh, you know, we know how big and legendary he is. He's such a great player, such a great singer. And, oh, he's uh, incredible. Yeah. But I really do believe that you guys played a little bit of that pioneer and to get it back on track uh, to where we kind of are now, which is really cool. Um, well, thanks. <laughs> one thing I want to go back to, though, man, is I think people should know, I'm looking here because I want to make sure I get this right, Jimmy Paxson was with Stevie Nicks and Jerry Brown was with Stevie Wonder, right? And those, and you were Correct. understudies of those folks. I think that yeah. is incredible, man. And uh, Jimmy Paxson's now been with the, he's also been with the Chicks for like 15, 20 years, I think. Oh, wow. At least 15. Oh. And then Jerry Brown's been with Diana Ross for 20 years. He was bouncing between her and Stevie Wonder. At, at a, there was a point in time where he was bouncing between the two. That's incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, you got all the education there. <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. It. And I'm still, you know, grateful to still be good friends with both of those guys. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, I mean, after this incredible time in college and you're getting all this, this knowledge on top of the talent you already possessed, like after college, how did you get into where you are now with Luke Combs? Like how did, how well, did you navigate the way to, to that, to be his drummer? I mean, I kind of just hit the ground running when I came here. I, I guess a little backstory. Um, my senior year in college, uh, I came to check out Nashville for a weekend with my parents to see if I'd like it. Um, and the way that kind of came about is remember bands like Creed, Evanescence, Seether. Never will forget them. They're great. My, da my dad's good buddy used to be the president and owner of their label. So he oh, said, wow. hey, Jake really wants to pursue this after college. He should go check out Nashville. So I did. I fell in love with it. The first area I really saw was the downtown honky tonk scene. And I'm like, this is great. It's music almost 24 seven, you know, a little less than that, but it's just music all the time. And I knew this is where I had to be. Um, through my former teacher, Mark, there is an alumni who lived here. He put me in touch with her. She invited me to a party on Music Row my second day here. I wasn't going to pass up and say no. I went, you know, it's it's all about networking, really. I talked to everyone there. There was a drummer who was there. He said, hey, I'm playing downtown. Come sit in. I did. There was a very inebriated bass player who happened to walk in on the two songs I was playing. He thought it was my gig after I got off. And um, I told him I moved here yesterday. He said, oh, we're auditioning drummers tomorrow. Come audition. I did. Found out an hour later, I got the gig, started doing that full time by the middle of my second week, which is very rare. Um, through backtracking a bit, when I came to visit here for the first time, I met a guy who worked at a clothing store and he told me he's a drummer. So we kept in contact and he said, when you get to town, uh, reach out, we'll get coffee. I did that. We got coffee. He texted me about four and a half, five months in after we had gotten coffee in town. Uh, saying he was leaving a group, no one major, but they tore a lot, come audition. So I did. I think I was the only guy who did audition. Got that gig within like 30 minutes to an hour, found out. So left the Broadway scene, did that for about six, seven months. Uh, it was great. It was a great experience, but it wasn't going where I saw myself in the long run. And I took some lessons with the drummer Jim Riley from Rascal Flatts and Gary Lavox. And I told them how I left this group. I would like to play with someone who's more my own age. I didn't know where I was going to, you know, come across that artist or, or group. You never know. Right. And he said, go to Riders Rounds. So I went to a place called Tin Roof on Demumbrian. I didn't know anyone there. I was just going out to listen to music, to just meet people and to network. And I walked in, you know, it was timing and luck at the same time and being very persistent with myself, just going out and not knowing anybody. But, um, you know, just happened to go in and he said, Hey guys, I'm, you know, Luke Combs. And, uh, you know, it's my last song. Pretty sure she got the best of me. And, uh, I just went up and talked to him afterward. And just said, hey, man, I really liked your song. You have an incredible voice. And he said, thank you. Um, and he said, what do you do? And I said, I play drums. Uh, I told him how I went to college for music. My whole, you know, I've been doing this ever since I was a kid. I don't know if he cared or hopefully he took it to heart. 
But um, he said, I, I have a gig next week. I really need a drummer. Do you want to play? And I said, I'd love to. You know, please send me material. I did my homework. I think a few days later, it was the rehearsal, like, slash my audition. I was the first one there 30 minutes early with all my stuff set up, ready to go. Um, you know, practiced from like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day till that time. And, uh, you know, we, I, I think when you do an audition or rehearsal, um, you know, if, if the, any, anybody who you're auditioning, whether it be a drummer, a guitar player, bass player, uh, utility guy, if they can't get through the first few songs, then you obviously know, okay, it's not a good fit, but I mean, I did my homework, so it was simple. You know, I, I played the parts well, I played the parts right. It was a good fit. Uh, and then we did the gig, and it was at the University of Alabama. It was at a frat house. I was the only one without a wedge, because that's what we were using at the time. So I really had to use my ears. We did that. Um, you know, it just showed I was a good hang. I didn't. I didn't do the things you shouldn't do. Obviously, I wanted to show that, like. I'm here, you know, I'm not um, a burden or I'm not drama or anything like that. I'm here. I'm serious. This is what I want to do. Uh, and he and I hung out once a week for the next three to four months, about every week. Um, and then he called me and said, hey, I want you to be my guy. You want to do this full time? And I said, yeah. And then we really started touring, I want to say either March or April, 2015, we were really hitting it. And, and, you know, I didn't know it was going to lead to this, or even if it just led to headlining arenas, I didn't know it was going to lead to that. It was just like, I believed in him. And thankfully he, he believed in me. And since the very beginning, I'm the only guy who has never missed a single show from 20, I guess I started since 20 end of 2014. Wow. Well, I mean, hearing you talk about the drive and the persistence and motivation and your discipline, even auditioning at that, at that level early on, I mean, I think that proves a lot. And if you've never missed a show, I mean, you've carried that your entire time and yeah. it's rooted you know. in your, you know, in your ethics and morals and stuff. And that, that's a, that's a big thing. Um, I mean, he know he knows that like, I will never, you know, I will never miss a show. Um, and it's funny that we're talking about this. It's like, you know, I spoke to my parents and my dad of like, you know, I was like, oh, you know, like say, you know, my this might be off topic, but it's like, you know, my grandma's older, you know, she's old. And, you know, I was like, you know, at some point, unfortunately, that's going to take place. And he was like, you know what? It's work. You're not missing work. And that's how I was raised. And that's how, you know, my dad is too. Is like, I miss many of friends weddings and stuff and because it's work. And yeah. unfortunately, when the parts of life that you don't want to think about happen, it's still work. And yeah, it's a hard thing to do, but like they'll plan that portion of the family stuff around hopefully my schedule or granted, I hope that doesn't happen for a long time. But, you know, my parents are very aware of the fact that this is my job. And they don't even want me like missing a show, which is wonderful. And and that's just also, you know, dedication from the parents end. You know, most mm -hmm. parents would never really, oh, our son's going to be a professional drummer or even think of doing music as a career. You know, they never, thankfully with them, they, I never had to have a plan B. It was yeah, always. It, it really does take the pressure off when, you know, you have that support from your family instead of not having it. So it allows for you to put your energy and all your effort into that with, with knowing there's always someone there for you if things change. Exactly. Um, but so you that's know, the, really nice to have. Yeah. And it's awesome. You know, I appreciate them supporting me since I was a little kid wanting to do this. That's excellent, man. And, um, you know, talking about how much that goes into it, you know, you're touring with Luke Combs and, as a touring drummer, it takes a toll on you as well. So let's talk about how like the difference of a studio drummer to your position as the touring drummer. So fans mm -hmm. can get an idea on kind of how that works and then what goes into that. Yeah. I mean, with a studio drummer, I mean, I do sessions, you know, here and there. Um, 
But with a studio drummer, that's all they do. They they might do two sessions a day and say it's four hour blocks. So they're doing they could crank out an EP, say it's five, six songs. They could do that in that four hour block and they move on to say doing a master session for the next four hours. But that's all they're doing when they're home is is you know, sessions. It could be demos, it could be master scale sessions, it could be EP, it could be everything in between. But they're not touring because either A, they've done it enough and they have a family or, you know, they're really tight with certain producers and they're being used so frequently that they don't have to go on the road. And then there's also some guys who might, you know, who might be terrified in front of crowds, but they're fine in studios. So it just it just depends, um, you know, but like, yeah, I am. You know, I think also at the same time, it's a lot harder to get into doing studio work full time because there's really an X amount of guys on every instrument that are doing it full time. Right. And to break in, it's like you have to be in town. So it's like, would you either A, know that you're secured touring with a wonderful, you know, artist and a wonderful road family? Or have to worry, when is my next session coming? Right. And I, I, I've i always kind of known, even before I moved to Nashville, that, like, I love educating. I love, you know, doing everything I can with the music of drumming of my capability to not just rely on touring to make a living. Right. Um, and I hope this is not, like, straying away from your question, but... You know, obviously, my main thing is touring. Yeah. I do sessions. I'm teaching a lesson, you know, at five o'clock today. I taught one on Monday. Um, now, do you do that through online? Because I know I know you give the lessons and teach. That's pretty cool. Do you give that online? I do that through Skype. Oh, okay, cool. Um, the one on Monday was through Skype. I have a few people who are um, either I'll go to their place or they can come to my house if it's in Nashville. Okay, nice. Um and then our bass player and I do clinics on the road. For the oh, most wow. part, it's every Saturday. And that's educating to more of the masses or however many people come out. And it's not like we just play um, because I've heard this from – do you know who the drummer Dave Weckl is? Have you heard his name before? He's a big jazz jazz guy. I have not. Um, he's really, really famous. But I saw him do an interview, and he was like, you know, people who come to my clinics – they just want to see me play, but it's like, ask questions. You know, you could watch, he was like, you can watch me play on YouTube all day long at your house. You can't get this interaction asking all these questions that frequently. So that's what we try to tell people too, is like, yeah, we have things that we can, we have like pointers or talking points that we could talk about, but we say like, we realize, cause we've been doing clinics together now over essentially the last year and a half. Wow. Um, you know, I've done That's some impressive. of my own. Yeah, I've done some of my own. He's done some on his own. But I remember la last year I was doing one in Denver and I was going to do one in Seattle. But of course, you know, things happened. Uh, but he, our base was like, hey, I've done them too. But, you know, I really want to get into them. And we, we, he and I both have that same mindset with like pretty much everything we do musically like he teaches as well we have the same we listen to the same stuff growing up same mindset and all that stuff so he's like hey you know would you care if i do clinics with you and i said not at all i said think about if you go to a, if you go to a bass or drum clinic you know it's just like the bass player and may, they might have someone but drum clinics typically are just the drummer and i thought man we could really capitalize on this and do a you know rhythm section clinic and talk about how do the how do the bass and drums or drums and bass feed off one another, and we could tell our experiences of being on the road, and how we each got this gig, and how we both got to Nashville, you know things of like and like what are endorsements, you know, the importance of networking, how to get and keep a gig, the importance of playing to a click, all these different things, how to tour with other people on the road, you know what is it like living in a, you know, a 15 passenger van or living in a bus or flying with people and, you know, sometimes sharing hotel rooms. If, you know, they tour can't do everyone get their own room, 
you know, how do you act, you know, all these different things. And so we try to tell people from the very beginning when we started the clinic, we realized the best way to go about this is just ask as many questions, whatever you have on your mind. There's no such thing as a silly or, you know, dumb question. And whenever you want us to play a song, just say, hey, we like these. We would like for you guys to play a song. And that's kind of how we've been going about it. And it's honestly great. Um, yeah. We do. You know, and they give a different songs. perspective from you because you're left handed. So some of the folks out there who aren't left handed, they get that, that is perspective always, as well. That's always a question. So, uh, we just did one in St. Louis and this guy was like, hey, I see that you play open handed. Are you left handed? And I am left handed, but I've been playing the way my kid is set up for so long now that my right hand is just as dominant as my left. And that's why I play the right, the ride with my right hand. Um, so I'm ambidextrous on the drums, which I can do more around the drum set than a right-handed player who plays right over left. Yeah. Cause they get in their own way sometimes with the, with the crossover. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a so really, that's a really unique and cool thing that, that you have in your playing style that you're left-handed and that it's, it's, it's open, which gives you way more versatility. Thank you. Yeah, you, know, you, you, know, okay. you know, also, um, you know, say you're playing a club show or, you know, arena or stadium, if you're open-handed and nothing against righty drummers, but if you're open-handed, you can make bigger motions, you know, think about if you're playing to an arena or a stadium, you want to be able to reach that person all the way in the upper deck and make them feel like they're just as close as the person in the pit. And I think that's one of the yeah. pros to playing open-handed. And I think that's harder to do when you're playing, when you're right-handed playing right over left. Yeah, I would say so. It probably gives you a little bit more time to, to take a second and allow those motions to be bigger and longer than, than say, a, a right-handed player. Um, yeah, I mean, you could throw, you could, it sounds silly, but you could throw your arms up even more, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, man. So I got to ask this because you, you're an incredible drummer, man, and it all had to, you all, you had to get some advice from somewhere. Which... Which drummer did you get any great advice from that you will forever remember? Oh, man. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we'll narrow it down to country music. We'll make it easier. <laughs> Which okay. country drummer? Um, you know, uh, do you know who Rich Redman is? I do. Isn't He's that become, Al, that's Al Dean's drummer, isn't it? Yep. He's yeah, become it's, a, it's Jason's drummer. Uh, a very good uh dear friend of mine. And, um, we were actually, I was fortunate enough to be, we were on tour with them in 2018, which was very cool to me because I remember, and sorry to backtrack, okay. um, 2013, when, before I moved to Nashville, I was getting the publication, modern drummer, and he was on the cover. And I thought, man, I want to be just like that guy, you know, or something like it. And I then went down the rabbit hole watching him on YouTube and I was like, man, this guy's awesome. Yada, yada. He's really good. And we become, really good friends from since 2013 to now. And um, he was one of the guys when I moved to town that it took some time to get coffee with, but he could tell how persistent I was. And he was like, you're going to make it in this town. And then, you know, it was like, okay, cool. W which I appreciated, but then it was like, we're touring in 2018 together. And now he and I are both um, nominated for country drummer of the year on the modern drummer readers poll, which is awesome. And it's like, you know, someone who I look up to who, okay, so uh, one of the best advice that I got from him was, you know, always have a smile on your face. Obviously, always play like it's your last gig. Give it everything you got. And the whole, what we just talked about, you know, playing to the person in the back row, making them feel like they're in the front. I got that from him. That's a really important piece of advice because sometimes it doesn't translate that high from folks. No, and not at I th all. And I think that really is. I mean, that's something maybe most don't think about, but you can you can tell when you're when you're reaching the stage as a as a fan in the crowd and when you're not. And I think that plays into it. And think about it too, from a drummer's perspective. You know, we're not in the front; we're in the back, so right. we're even further. Like even our, I don't know if you've seen a show this year or if you've seen our stage plot from videos and stuff, but 
I'm pretty far back from even the pit. Yeah. So just reaching them, I really have to like bring this energy. But then you look out and you see the people who are all the way in the back up top and you're like, okay, you know, you really got to, and you should always want to bring your A game and that energy. So I always try to do that every show, no matter if I'm tired, if I have a headache, whatever the case may be, you just got to push through. And it's like, you know, you love it. it. It's what you love to do. So it's just like everything, all your worries or whatever you have go away once, you know, once you take the stage. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think it's great advice. I think you took that advice and you're, you are translating that so well. Um, like I said, y'all shows are just incredible and you can tell every member in the band, are, they're in tune with what's happening. They're feeling the energy and, uh, with, with your playing style already, you you know, you're, you're really open with your playing style as far as people can still see you, even though you might not be on the big screen. Like you, you do get the attraction from folks looking back at the drummer. And, uh, that's a really good piece of advice, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by just how energetic that show is. And Thank you, you. you do just an excellent job back there. Um, a couple more questions that I have for you, cause I don't want to take too much of your time, man. Like I said, I appreciate you coming out. Oh yeah, yeah. no, of course. What is one of the wildest moments on tour you guys have had? Ooh, like a story that is hilarious or whatever. Just one of the wildest moments you guys have shared. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's one. It just popped in. Oh man. There's so many. <laughs> Um, I guess here, here's, it's not, it's not gonna be like too, too crazy, but, uh, Billy, it's pretty funny. So I don't know who it was there. There's a few, uh, I'll tell you too. So this is not even like tour. This is just within the band and it was just really funny. And it was recent. One of, I think one of our band guys, friends <laughs> made these huge cutouts of each of our faces and I was going to bed one night in the bus I felt something behind my head and I didn't know what it was. And I pull it out and it's a giant cutout of my face. And then I wake up in the morning. Like I kept mine in my bunk. I wake up in the morning and some of the other guys have it in the front lounge of their faces. And I put mine there and it was just a hilarious photo. And then someone someone took it home. But uh, just uh, something that – I wouldn't say this is like uh, – I've been pranked a few times by our band leader and uh, there was, it was pretty good. Um, so we were in Canada last year and myself and one of our other guys, I go pro, I try to go pro every show. And one of our other guys, he was doing it a little bit here and there. And uh, it was our band leader and our production manager who decided to come up with this prank to where um, they're like, Hey, you know, in Canada, you're not allowed to go pro the shows. Um, they have to take your camera away and you're going to be fined like $1,500. And our, I didn't know, like they typed out a whole fake, <laughs> you know, oh, man. thing on the, on uh, you know, printing paper with a whole letter and with the seal, of, like the, the place we we're playing and everything like that. And it was in our production manager's office. And I was having lunch with some people with some of our band guys. And, uh, our production manager called me and was telling me about this because I had no idea. And I said, okay, like I'll come back after lunch, you know? And uh, I said, well, you know, can I just delete the footage? I haven't even posted anything yet. Like I'll delete the footage. I'll put the GoPro in my backpack. I won't use it for the rest of the time. And he's like, man, they, they won't accept that. Like, you know, you might have to pay like $1,500. And I was like, if that's what I have to pay. Okay, fine. You know, like, I think it's a little ridiculous, Yeah, but, <laughs> and then uh because our other guy was pretending the free guy i think he knew about it because he got the same thing and he was like dude did you hear what so and so or did you get so and so's text and i was like no not yet and then i got it and uh i was like okay like i'll meet you back there and i don't know if he was fully in on it or if he was just kind of half in on it but i think they were expecting me to freak out more and i was like you know what if i have to pay this i will but like, and then of course our band leader came in and goes, dude, we were just, like, we were just kidding with you. I was like, For real, I like would have paid that if I had to, to, you know, or I was like, I was going to delete the footage. He goes, don't delete the footage. It was a, he was like, uh, we we're, we tried to get you. And I was like, 
not this time, not this time. <laughs> but but there, there, been some, there have been some really good pranks. We all have some pretty – there was one day uh, last room we were in Canada, and everybody in the band – in our room, had, we had those ice. They had those ice baths, and they had two of the, two of them next to each other. So we all did it together. Like two guys went in, another two guys went in, all that stuff. And uh, they're like, "Hey, you got to be in for five minutes." And I think I only lasted about three minutes in there. My legs were shaking. I was like, "I'm yeah, I bet." Obviously, freezing cold, and I was like, "I we have to play a show later. Like I can't feel my legs right now." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but there's a hilarious photo that I have in my phone. It was, of course, me and our bass player. And we were jokingly holding hands. And I was, like, just laughing. My Like, I was cringing while he was just laughing his butt off. Um, That's funny, man. Yeah. The, rhythm se- the rhythm section staying together on that. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, we are – we're we're – I mean, we're all super, super close. I would say, you know, obviously due to the fact that he and I, you know, do clinics together and, you know, like for us to book the clinics, we get together and we're home to call cold call these places months ahead of time Yeah, and plan it out. But, uh, I mean, we're all, we're all super, super close. Yeah. You guys uh, have a great camp there, man. Such a great group. And, uh, it sounds like y'all have a lot of fun on the road, which is a, which is a big thing. I mean, trying to mesh well we when do. you stay together. So, yeah. You know, I mean, that's cool. great. We, uh, yeah, where were we? We were somewhere near. I know we were. Um, it was after the Grammys this year. We were in Scottsdale playing uh, the Pandora Sirius XM thing for the Super Bowl and uh, or pre Super Bowl. And we had a few days off. So four of us, one of our guys rented a car and four of us went and uh rented airbnb we just drove out somewhere two hours i forgot exactly where but uh we like went hiking and all this stuff we had a great time yeah that's great man i mean that you got to have that camaraderie to to keep going as long as you guys have together and Mm -hmm. uh, to be successful out there on the road i got two more questions for you one real quick we're going to do some spitfire here if you had one artist to play for if you could sit in for who would it be country or any genre we'll do we'll do country Ooh, um, shoot. I've always loved Al Dean's music. Like, um, I think that, cause that's more of like a rock gig. Yeah. I think that'd be a lot Kinda of Kind of get the best of both worlds there. Mm-hmm. Um, that, or I'd have to work on my double bass chops, but Hardy would be a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be, that'd be killer. To go um, play with, with those probably guys. those two guys. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then the other one I have for you is, if you had any piece of advice at where you are now, what would you tell your younger self in, in doing the drumming? Who? Um, that's a very good question. Um, just within drumming or the whole facet of. You can do the whole experience. Just what, yeah, you can do the whole experience. Like what piece of advice would you give your younger self if you yeah. could go back and speak um, to yourself? I would say you know, constantly practice, constantly do whatever you can to get better. Um, Say yes to everything till you don't need to. Um, Always be kind to everyone you meet. You never know where, you know, you'll cross paths in life again, you know, and there, it could be a time where like, you know, you might need some work and, you know, they call you and say, Hey, I want to be, you know, are you free to gig or whatever the case may be, or play on this session of mine. You never know where that could come full circle. So always be nice to everyone. Um, always have a smile on your face. If, you know, especially if you're, you know, out in public and, and networking and, um, you know, cause no matter what, I don't know. I think life should, should always have a positive outlook on life and have a positive attitude. Um, of course there are, you know, there's obviously times in life where negative things take place, but for the most part, it's like you only get one life. You got to live it to the most. I'm not saying do, do outlandish things, but like, you know, always keep your head down with doing the right things and, you know, work hard, um, 
be a team player. And I think in the long run, it'll pay off and believe in yourself, you know, if, you know, believe in yourself, but don't, don't have that ego, egotistical attitude. Yeah. Um, Great advice. You know, never think you're better than anybody else because it could be over tomorrow. That's right, man. That's a really good piece of advice. Thanks. Um, a lot I'm of folks need, myself a lot right of, now, by the way. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, you gotta, you gotta remind I mean, yourself I to stay to myself too today, but yeah. it's like, that's kind of just how I think in general, yeah. no matter you know, so I, I think if, yeah, when I was younger, it's like, I just always thought, I just want to play drums. You know, I just want to, you know, I didn't know where it was going to end up, but it's like looking back when I was a kid to now, it's like, that's what I would definitely tell myself. But all that outside advice, I mean, drums were obviously the sole focus, but all that outside advice is what really makes it possible in the end too. Uh, because yeah. Oh no, it all, it all yeah. stems back to absolutely drums or whatever instrument or, honestly, whatever you do as a career, yeah. you yeah. know, in the long I mean, it's run, anything. it's like, yeah. it's anything. Well, great, great advice, man. And just from my own personal knowledge, cause I'm interested and in, I'm sure the folks are too. What was your audition songs? So it wasn't really, um, it wasn't just like a few songs. Like we actually, I only call it my audition because there are no other drummers there auditioning. Okay. It was me rehearsing for the gig, which okay, I was you. playing anyway. So um, at the time, his songs that we were playing, because we were doing covers back then too. We were doing Let the Moon Shine. I Know She Ain't Ready. Uh, we were doing She Got the Best of Me, but it was the previous version. Mm -hmm. um, we were doing, um, you know what? I actually have it. Give me one second. I have the set list still. Let oh, me wow. find it. Right there. Yeah, I have it right. I have it right here. Look at the. Oh, look, well, at, the look at that. Look how convenient that was. <laughs> um, the question was meant it. to be. Yeah. Um, so uh, from his stuff, it was she got the best of me. Uh, you could share if you want to. Um, I know she ain't ready. Can I get an outlaw? Um, I think I'm pretty sure can't believe you're leaving at the time was even, I don't think it was even though you're leaving, uh, let the moon shine the way she rides. Yeah. Th those are all the originals we did from him. Wow. And then, uh, you know, if, if you guys want to know the other ones, um, it kind of went my kind of party, uh, so covering some Jason Aldean, get me I think it's get me or give me some of that. How country feels anywhere with you. Don't you hard to love run in the moonlight, American kids, the one that got away, Talladega, leave the night on night moves, chicken fried cruise, chilling it, uh, sweet home, Alabama, simple man, copperhead road, drinking my hand and friends in low places. Wow. Man, that's a yeah, that's a heck of a set list there. I I, I figured I would hear, I figured I would hear some Eric Church in there, and the Randy mm -hmm. Hauser is pretty sweet too, man. Knocking out some Randy Hauser tunes, Jake. Oh Cohen, yeah, man, you guys guy had could a, sing, yeah, sing the uh, dictionary as well. <laughs> yeah, he could. But, um, no, I mean that that shoot the fact that I, you know, still have that. That's the that's cool, man. Original. That needs to go on the well, fridge. <laughs> you put that thing up on yeah. the fridge, dude. Yeah, right, um, right. A plus, right on the top of it. <laughs> I'm kind of curious if the other guys still have that, but yeah, that that is a that set list is I guess is going to be ten years old in November. Wow, that is yeah, cool. I'm, I'm man. shocked I still have it. I don't know if the other guys do, but I definitely I'd I, hang on I, to that I, thing. I was like, man, I'm not. I'm obviously never getting rid of that, but like, it's pretty cool to still have that. Yeah, really, man. Well, Jake, thank you so much for coming on the channel today. Guys, we got a nominated Best Country Drummer right here. Luke Combs is drummer. This man is absolutely amazing. If you've not seen Luke Combs in the band out on the road, go do so. You will not be disappointed. Jake, thank you so much for being here, man. It has been yeah, a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, it was great running into you in Virginia. Oh, yeah, man. It was excellent. It was like the timing was perfect. So we're going to have to link up next time you're back down here. Yeah, and definitely keep in touch. Yeah, will do, man. Thank you so much for being here. Of course. Thanks for having me.